tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 3 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Oh, perception. How many times in our lives, hell, sometimes on a daily basis, things just don't always seem as they are presented. It reminds me of an interaction with an English fellow and an Irishman. An Englishman and an Irishman enter a bakery. The Englishman steals three cookies, puts them into his pockets, and whispers, That took great skill and guile to steal those cookies. The Irishman replies, That's just simple thievery. Here's how to do it the honest way and get the same results. He calls the owner and says, Sir, allow me to perform a magic trick for you. The owner is intrigued and says, Let's see it. The Irishman asks for three cookies and quickly eats them. Skeptical, the owner asks, Okay, my friend, where's the magic trick? The Irishman smugly says, Look in the Englishman's pockets. Two strange tales tonight where perceived reality is just that, perception. They are brought to us by the likes of Eli Pope and Malcolm Tanner. Let's get after it. Have you ever looked deep into a mirror and wonder if maybe, just maybe, it's an entirely different world that coexists with the one outside the reflection? Meet Dwayne, just another old guy that blends into the seedy nightlife of living inside a neighborhood bar with all the other regulars. The bartender doling out the nightly mixtures and concoctions to help kill the demons existing within. Ever wonder why bars have mirrors behind them? Be careful looking too deep. It may beckon you inside a world with no escape. An alter universe, if you will. And now, for your indulgence, Conversing with My Reflection by Eli Pope. Chapter 1 I pulled the door open and stepped inside Dutch's tavern. It seemed familiar, but I paused at the entry until carefully glancing over the bar's interior. My eyes scoured the inside from the left side of the door completely around to the right of the entrance I had just entered. I quickly noticed the usuals, of which I myself had become since moving into the neighborhood three months earlier. At first glance, I thought the place was a seedy dive filled with middle-aged alcoholic men who more than likely hated their lives, their old ladies, and rugrats. There were always likely widowed wives who had possibly killed their loser husbands and were now frequenting this joint to pick up men who would tickle their sexual desires. Well, and of course work on drinking the insurance money dry. Don't get me wrong, the real estate in the area appeared to be well kept but the actual people's appearances and attire who sat in here didn't seem to fit the neighborhood. But who was I to judge? I'm just the new move-in to the community, trying to stay back in the shadows and blend. 
Yeah, blend. A quick guffaw escaped from under my breath. I smiled as I then laughed out loud as if I was with somebody. That seems to be my life story. Don't ever stick out too much and live life. Just be happy settling back and fading into the scenery. Or at least that's what I had convinced myself. I wasn't totally certain of just what my reality was nowadays. Life was a bit of a blur since... Never mind. I wasn't going down that lane tonight. Not until the call for bourbon was answered. The large mirror behind the bar was lined with the establishment's different flavors and varieties of whiskeys, gins, vodkas. You know. If you've ever stepped foot into any small local bar, they always have their libations lined up in front of a mirror. Lights always shining brightest on the labels they're trying to push. The ones with the best profit margins. I held no favorite. Just give me the house version and keep pouring. I suppose that fit into that grouping that laughed at marketing and cheap whiskey was what usually called out my name. Branding didn't matter. I'd been introduced to Jack Daniels like most any other high school kid back in the day. I never understood the draw to old Jack, though. It had a bite, only enjoyable as an additive to a Coke or 7-Up, not smooth enough to enjoy straight up. But I'd drink it if they were pushing, and the price was affordable. I favored a Weller's or a Dickel, but in this town, I reckon they must be considered a special import. Hell, my wallet was too thin for either of those tonight anyway. I chuckled aloud to myself again at my wit. I hadn't found a bar that carried either anyway, so house brand it was. Most of the time it was a good smooth bourbon for the price, at least after the third round. The large mirror called my name for other reasons than just the fact it made their collection of bottled booze appear twice the quantity that was truly there. Reflections. They don't always tell the truth, do they? At least that's what I've determined through the years. There were many times throughout my life when I'd walk by a mirror and say to myself, you're a goddamn good looking man. When deep down, I knew the reflection was certainly making me appear twice as handsome as I truly was. Reflections tell little white lies that we take in and soon start believing. That's what I've come to realize anyway. It has its exceptions to the rule, of course, like about every other observation does. For instance, tonight, when I investigate the mirror's reflection of myself as I sit here waiting for my usual double bourbon on the rocks, nary a word from the bartender. I can just nod as a regular now. My mama would be proud. I snickered. Anyway, that mirror reflects that I appear twice as lonely as I think I look. Only thing is, that's only half of how lonely I truly feel tonight. Crazy thought, huh? Well, shit. Here I go carrying on another internal conversation with myself as if I were just two regulars sitting at a bar enjoying each other's company. By the time I get a double or two down, I'll be internally slurring my conversation both sides. I chuckled to myself again at my comedic attempt. I laughed another short guffaw after realizing if I had had my drink in hand, I'd be wearing part of it on my lap appearing like I'd peed myself. The bartender just poured the second jigger of tan liquid friendship into the glass of ice. My heartbeat tempo sped up just a beat. Does this make me a guy with a drinking problem? Here you go, buddy. Double bourbon on the rocks. He set the glass down on top of a napkin as if this were more than just a small neighborhood watering hole. I know you've been here several times. I'm not that great with names yet, but I think I remember yours as Dwayne. Is that right? That would be correct, Paul. I retorted as I lifted the glass and held it up, slightly tipping it to acknowledge a thank you. Well, enjoy this one on the house, Dwayne. Good to see you here again. He smiled. I nodded and took a sip. Paul turned and began mixing drinks for other patrons, leaving me here to my current conversation with myself and staring at that damned good-looking lonely guy across me tipping his glass to his lips in unison with myself. I grin. The other man is, of course, me, and he's just average in the looks department. If I were a woman, I'd guess I'd do him. Another chuckle gurbled up from the diaphragm. 
I gazed at my reflection but attempted to picture myself at a much younger age, back when I used to sit beside my dad at the local bar, back when nobody said that couldn't be done, back before we fucked this world up for our kids or at least finally realized it. Everything now so damn politically correct and non-offending. Anyway, I remember he had let me drink the foamy suds from the top of his beer. We'd sit together while he talked to his Navy buddies when they were back from sea duty. It made me feel special and older than the nine or ten years I probably was. I heard more cuss words and stories involving naked women and getting the hell out before her old man came back home than I can remember now. Funny how you want to be grown up and older when you're young. Hell, now that I've passed 60 and sitting here noticing the gray creeping into my now thinning hair, I'd probably give a year's pay to go back 20 years for a do-over. Guess that's certainly proof that God has a sense of humor. Or at the least, a small bit of evil inside. I tipped the glass back to my lips and drew a deep sip, letting the flavor of the whiskey pool on my tongue for a second or two before swallowing it down. I could feel my ghosts begin to stir inside as they were more than likely to commingle with the alcohol. They were most always friendly ghosts, but they were still ghosts. I'm not crazy. At one time I had sworn they were just my imagination, but I knew better now. I knew just when my brain let them enter inside too. I was 19, vulnerable, and high as a fucking kite. Chapter 2 Lysergic Acid Diethylamide LSD My mood had been altered even before the substance was induced. It was a Friday. Work had sucked. My boss was an asshole trying to sell me down the river while he hurriedly paddled upstream, right up his boss's ass. I was ready to walk, but I had rent and food and beer obligations to buy. I'd stick it out one more week. Therefore, the evening became a quagmire not too far from the start. I looked back into the mirror. It seemed to be challenging me. I realize it's inanimate and... In a normal world, it wouldn't be possible for such a thing to happen. Two things. I accept its challenge to a staring contest because it has no idea how many hours of my life have been spent exploring every aspect of my face. Right down to the nose hairs I swear I saw grow once. So many hours staring and conversing with myself through my reflection that I've realized a mirror is my best friend. And the other thing? This world I live in runs parallel to the normal world you and the others exist in. I know at least at times I can be seen, but most times people look right through me as if I don't exist, as if I'm just a glitch or flaw in the corner of the reflection. This brings me to the conclusion I must bounce in and out between these two worlds with absolutely no control over it. I get fooled into thinking I'm in your real world when I'm actually in mirror world and vice versa. The LSD a friend gave me when I was 19 was the vehicle that flipped my existence to where I'm now trapped and live. The hallucinations left, but the world it transported me to refused to relinquish my soul back in its entirety, but instead toys with my existence. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? I laugh out loud as I realize I'm again carrying on a silent conversation as if you are sitting next to me sharing a drink like real friends do at a bar. Only my friend happens to be me. It's pathetic the way that sounded. It makes me want to walk away and rethink my choice of friends I keep company with. I laugh again and the bartender glances over my way. He probably assumed he missed another customer walking up that might need a drink or a refresher until he noticed again, it was only me. I'm about to need another drink, though, so I hope he sees me and I'm not invisible. So, back to the quagmire-filled evening some 30 years back. That's why you're sitting here with your attention on pins and needles in expectations of my story, right? I'd been going out with this new girl. Well, like two times. We weren't really an item yet. Of course, we did sleep together, so there's that. 
but I kind of told her I had plans. Hell, I thought I did. It wasn't an everyday occurrence that I ingest LSD. A guy I worked with turned me on to it. I laugh again, reminiscing about the hippie language way back then and the fact I still use it. Occasionally. We were supposed to go out bar tripping. His words. I later understood just what he meant. Anyway, I'm just starting to hum along, seeing some trails from any movements I noticed. My dog walked by, and he looked like he was doing 80. I chuckle as I see my face in the mirror again and catch myself talking with my hands. But I know the dialogue is silent, just inside my head. I bet Paul by now is keeping a keen eye my way, probably thinks I'm tripping now. I smile at the thought. If one could bypass all the crazy drama that came with my first and only trip, I think I'd enjoy doing it again. But I'm too old and mature now. The gray hair around my temples screams volumes that LSD would not be a good idea at this point in my life. I'm probably in the stroke or heart attack age now. Anyway, I'm buzzing along waiting for my friend to show, and all of a sudden, as if I forced it with my mind, there was a knock on my apartment door. I bet it took me 10 minutes to find my way to it. My apartment was very small, but when you're tripping, apparently the new world you're visiting makes everything that was once mundane or banal become something brand new and deeply intoxicating to stare at in depth. I stopped and studied every picture on my wall and every knick-knack paddywhack piece of crap on the tables, couch, and breakfast bar. Old empty beer cans were now works of art, masterpieces to appreciate. If one was dented in the slightest, it became the Picasso. If there was a piece of drooping pizza beside it, it became a Salvador Dali. I suddenly realized my messy apartment wasn't messy. It was a fucking art museum. I finally made it to the door and opened it, and I was trying to decide how much I should charge for tickets to enter and admire my collections. My guests weren't the friend I was expecting. In fact, it was the girl I had gone out with, and she seemed very unhappy to see me. She's running around with my friend Dave, whom I didn't even know they knew each other, and I'm the bad guy sitting at home alone. She started calling me every name in the book, and as she and Dave moved around my living room, the trails began mixing and their faces mutated into cackling clown monsters. I wasn't sure if I should run and hide, sit and laugh profusely, or search for a weapon to defend myself. I lifted my drink and tipped it so far back to finish the last drops that the ice cubes rolled down and smacked me in the upper lip and tooth. It kind of hurt and brought me back to current world. At least I think. Paul was right there to ask if I needed another, to which I raised my eyebrows and followed with, Does a shark shit in the ocean? He snickered and grabbed the half-empty bottle. The evening was still young. Here in this little neighborhood bar in Nowhereville, I started to continue my story. To myself, but grew tired. Besides, I spied an older woman coming in, and she wasn't half bad to look at. I could use some real company. I think my body could even hold up to some actual physical activity, if you know what I mean. I winked into the mirror. I watched, and I couldn't believe she came and sat at the bar. Only one seat between us. I thought, what the hell? Could I buy your first round, miss? I'm harmless, I promise. I grinned what I felt was a cute but non-threatening smile. I nodded as I saw she already had a drink. What you enjoying tonight? Dewar's White Label, she replied. Not too bad. Feel like honey and fudge with a grapefruit finish. Hey, Paul, pour the lady another doer's white. Double over the rocks. Thanks, brother. He nodded and I turned back to the lady. Dwayne, Dwayne Killigan. I'm new to the area. Kill again? I'm not certain I should tell you my name. She tried to grin but now seemed taken back. No, ma'am. It's pronounced Gilligan, you know. Gilligan's Island from... Well, I won't presume you'd be old enough to remember that sitcom. I tried to recover. I'm just teasing you, Dwayne. My name is Shannon. For now, let's just stick with my first name, just in case. 
She smiled slyly again and licked her lips after taking a sip. She was correct. I'd kill again to have company like her tonight. It's been a long while. I turned to the mirror and saw my twin nod in agreement. I glanced away from my reflection to Shannon's and was surprised to see her moving to the chair that was once separating us. I blushed for a minute as my heart raced. My conversations are usually rather one-sided and rarely with the opposite sex. Oh, sex. I think I'd still enjoy some of that. I wasn't used to picking women up, though. I brazened up and moved my gaze from her reflection in mirror world to real world in the flesh. I could see a familiarity in her face. I couldn't put my finger on it, though. You look like somebody, I blurted out. This time I think I said it out loud. My throat tickled for a minute and would not let another word follow. She gave me an awkward chortle. Well, you look like someone too. I guess we both have that. Must make us special. It came to me all of a sudden. I knew who she reminded me of. I met someone public, but I got it now. You look like Joanne Woodward. I'm sure you've heard that before, haven't you? She smiled as if she was caught off guard and her smirk reminded me even more. I've heard it before, she said, holding her doers to her lips. Yeah, Joanne Woodward. Always wished I could fuck her. Dead silence filled the space between us. Had I actually said that out loud? I looked back to the mirror for an answer without having to look her square in the eye. Hmm. Her eyes batted a few times. So, you wanna? She asked. I mean, I'm not really Joanne, but... Are you serious? Well, you suggested it, and I'm just saying, I can be Joanne for you. I can be any lady you want me to be. Hell yes. I hate to say something so overused and script like, but your place or mine? Chapter 3 Mr. Killigan, the orderly leaned over and spoke again. Hey, Duane, it's time for treatment, buddy. The orderly rolled his eyes. Not again with the self-gratification, Mr. Killigan. But I'm with a lady. Look at her. I think she's really Joanne Woodward. She wants to have sex with me. Ask her. Duane, buddy, Mike nodded to his helper. It was a silent signal that there may be some agitation. Dwayne, it's time for your treatment again. It's your final one. I don't know how to tell you this, but there's no woman here. It's just you and the mirror out here in the commons again. It's okay. Charlie and I are going to help you out, okay? No troubles. Just going to take you for your last treatment. But, but Joanne, she's... I looked up at the mirror to see Mike. The Mike in Mirror World. She was there. You've run her off, damn it. I haven't been laid in... Mike reached over and tapped my arm. He didn't think I'd see it coming, but I did, in the mirror. Don't touch me. I'm going with Joanne. Joanne Woodward. I grinned because I knew she was here, probably in the powder room freshening herself up. Charlie came over quickly and got on one side of me while Mike tightened in on the other. I fought them, though. They weren't going to stop me from getting laid by a movie star. Uh, stop! I'll kill you, sons of... Okay, okay. That hurts. Just let me... My breathing was fast. I couldn't suck enough air in my lungs, but I fought as if my life depended on it. I wasn't going to let these real-world monsters take me. I didn't want to get strapped in again. Can't handle not being able to move my arms or head. Stop! Help! Somebody... I'm being kidnapped. My chest hurt. It hurt bad. My arms were cramping too. Help, Joy! Call the police. There, there. It hit like a lightning strike. My back arched and the room went blurry. All I could see were the outlines of ghosts. The monsters were winning. They had too many. Joanne! I screamed as loud as I could. Paul, Paul! Rapid breathing, short breaths, and spent energy. I kicked and hit anything I could catch contact with as I was drugged down the hallway. 
No, don't no, put my horse in that. I can't. Please don't. All of a sudden, I felt a pain like I've never felt. I think they stabbed me. I want to scream, but I can't make words exit. It hurts so much. Please, Mirror World, take me back. I don't want to be real. I don't want to. Chapter 4 So, this was the state sanatorium at one time? The one they finally closed down because of my mom's work? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Akers. Your mom investigated many of the stories that were the talk of the town 32 years ago. City council has been talking about tearing it down. Kids sneak around and try to get in, but it's been kept secure and under video observation for the last 20 or so years. Not a soul's been inside since 1998. That's what, 23 years? Yes, Ms. Akers. This place has been home to a lot of rumors and controversy. I, for one, will be glad to see it removed. A lot of lives have been altered or shattered because of this place. The town just about died when it closed. And then there's all the ghost stories. I'll admit there's been some crazy stuff happen around here while I've been in charge. But, Mr. King, you are still going to let me go in and look around and later point me in the direction of some of the doctors and nurses that are still alive. One's willing to finally share their stories, right? Ben King fidgeted. I'm a man of my word. I'll admit, though, I wish I wouldn't have agreed. Sometimes I think there are things better left in the past, dead and buried. I'd counter with the fact that, most times, it's better not to suppress secrets and let them become twisted rumors. Plus, if some of those rumors are correct and the abuse really did happen... Ben King began walking towards the front door. Then it's time to clear the lies and possibly get some retribution for the families who may have lost their loved ones to some inadequate treatment and even intentional abuse. She followed Mr. King up the chipped, painted concrete steps. The large wooden doors held chains through their handles and cameras pointed down at them, blinked on and off, making her aware she was being recorded. The boarded-up windows needled her imagination to conjure visions of how haunted the dark interior would be. Mr. King tried key after key, attempting to insert them in the lock until Betty Akers heard the clunk and watched the lock drop free and swivel to the side. Mr. King squeezed the trigger on the handle, releasing the door and making it free to open. He continued, There's going to be a lot of dust, I imagine. Are you allergic? No, sir. We're here, and it's taken four months to get this done. You're not going to dissuade me now that we're to this point and the door's open. The door creaked and took some pressure from Ben to push it open enough for them to squeeze in. This, of course, must be the commons. This would have been an area the patients who could be trusted or were low-level threat could sit and read or kill time. Betty's eyes roamed the room and was strangely drawn to a large mirror to the far right. She looked over to Ben as if to ask if she was free to walk around. He nodded in agreement. She walked slowly at first, but after seeing something that interested her, she walked more briskly. Ben followed behind. The large mirror was cracked as if something hit it hard. It was shattered in the corner and she noticed there appeared to be a scuffle in the area below. The entire floor was covered in years of dust, except the area around the mirror. It looked like a painting with brush strokes of smeared dust exposing a light green and grayish speckled terrazzo floor. Betty looked over to Ben inquisitively. This looks fresh. It's almost polished clean in sporadic strokes of movement or struggle. She walked closer to the mirror and studied the area that had been hit with something. She spied a dark red liquid. Her finger went instinctively to it and dabbed it. It's still wet, Mr. King. That can't be, Ms. Akers. There's been no one in this building for over 20 years. He drew his finger towards the glass mirror and touched the red spot. He rubbed his thumb and finger together lightly and held them up to his nose. Smells kind of like rust or something. They both glanced around and noticed footsteps and an area that looked as if something had been dragged. 
Every so often it appeared as if there were a scuffle and then more dragging marks through the dust. The two followed the trail down the hallway full of doors on both sides for several feet, maybe 50 or 60, and then made a turn down a different hallway. Another 50 or so feet of the same dust cleared path before it ended at a doorway. The door had a sign above a frosted paned window that held wire reinforcement within. The sign said, Warning, Electroshock Treatment, High Voltage, Danger. The two looked at each other. While they glanced around the hallway, almost dazed with what they were seeing, they both were jolted back toward the room. The window had flashed as if the lights went on and off quickly. An audible hum could be heard followed by a muffled groan. A groan that sounded as if it came from pain. Chills appeared to fill both of their faces. Betty's arms instantly mimicked a plucked turkey skin. Before they could react, the door began to open. Both Mr. King and Ms. Aker's eyes were open as wide as possible, white completely visible around each of their pupils and irises. There were several silhouettes with doctor's gowns and head coverings, along with masks, and they began to usher Ben and Betty in. Oh, Mr. King and Ms. Akers, we've been hoping to see you. There have been rumors you would be visiting us. Neither Mr. King nor Ms. Akers were able to say a word or see the wicked smiles that were most certainly hidden underneath the masks. The door closed quietly, and a few minutes later, the window began to flicker on and off again. The faint hum of high-voltage electricity filled the empty hallways. If nobody hears the screams of terror and pain, is there really a sound being made? Or like an empty forest, would anyone standing on the outer edge ever notice a tree fall in the middle? One wonders if there were a mirror inside the room. Would the reflections of terror be transmitted to other mirrors in Mirror World for others to witness? A bar stool sat empty at Dutch's Tavern. A woman who resembled Joanne Woodward sat in a stool beside the empty spot, staring at a half-filled glass of house bourbon. As she glanced up at Paul the bartender, she swore she saw the reflection of an older gentleman lift the half-empty glass to his lips before disappearing in a flash. I sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, Conversing with My Reflection, written by Eli Pope. Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion laid dormant for decades, while life took him different directions. The stories never left, and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head, telling him to put them on paper and put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for all four books of the Mason Jar series, The Judgment Game, The Spark of Wrath, The Glass House, and The Reclamation, which you, dear listener, can hear on audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com That's Eli E-L-I Pope P-O-P-E dot com He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope or search groups on Facebook The Mason Jar Room Jane and Mark are falling into the suburban funk They have had some tough years in their relationship and Mark has strayed Jane just doesn't seem interesting to him any longer. Jane decides she will do something about Mark's inattention to her. She plans a big surprise for her hubby, and he thinks maybe she is coming around. But she has learned over time that the only thing she needed to have that Mark denied her was power. How will Jane use that power? Mark's burning question is whether to stay with Jane or move on with his mistress, Sarah. Will Jane help with the answer to that question? You'll find out as they both navigate the rough terrain of unfaithfulness. Be careful where you wake up in the morning. 
And now for your indulgence, Waking Up With Jane by Malcolm Tanner. Chapter One, Just an Illusion. How in the hell did I get here? Oh yeah, I was with Sarah Painter, my secretary, and her sexy body got me here. Looks like the same ceiling in the same place we always come to. I always look up at the ceiling fan taking its rotations and feeling the pounding of another headache from drinking too much. Looking at the fan too long is making me sick. I rolled over and sat on the edge of the bed, not looking over at Sarah. I put my face in my hands and rubbed my temples. This headache needed to go away. I dropped my hands and stood up, turning to look at Sarah once more. The body in the bed rolled over and sat up, dropping the sheet and exposing her naked breasts. Startled, I jumped. Jesus, what the... Jane? I rubbed my eyes to be sure I wasn't dreaming. There sat my lovely and beautiful wife, Jane, smiling. You look like you've just seen a ghost, my love. Are you okay? Yes, yes, I'm fine. I must have had a bad dream, I said, turning to go to the bathroom. Damn, I must be going crazy. Hell, I know I was with Sarah last night. How in the hell did Jane get here? What time is it? Where am I exactly? I splashed water in my face, hoping its cold shock would bring me to reality. Is this a dream? I started to feel dizzy and the hangover wave was overcoming me. The room around me was spinning and my vision blurred. I stumbled and almost dropped to the floor as I grabbed the sink and held on tight. I regained my balance and started to go back into the room. Damn, whiskey. I walked back to the bed and, well, it wasn't a hotel room at all. It was my bedroom. Jane's and my bedroom. We shared it for the past ten years, but there hadn't been much action in it for a while. But I thought I was in a motel with Sarah last night. What happened to Sarah? I ambled down the steps of our fancy brick home in the burbs to have breakfast, still wondering what in the hell the whiskey did to me. Blackout on my feet? Didn't remember? Someone slipping a drug in my shots of whiskey? Sorry, I came in a little late last night. Guys from the office wanted to have a few drinks. Got to drinking some whiskey and must have had a hard time remembering getting home. I lied. Well, I hope you did remember what we did last night, Jane said, smiling and looking coy. We haven't had sex like last night in years. You were good. Oh, so good, Mark. Jane said, moving closer to me to kiss me on the neck. Well, glad we got to share some closeness. Yes, it had been a while. There's something... I hesitated and thought better of bringing up Sarah. Maybe Jane was trying and maybe I could get back to a monogamous relationship. Maybe this was bad timing and Sarah had just been on my mind too much. Now I had a problem. I needed to talk to Sarah. Saving my relationship with Jane, or dumping Jane and taking up with Sarah? It was my burning question for the past two years. There's something what, dear? Oh, nothing, just nothing. Something I thought about for us to do tonight. Maybe have dinner and see a show? I'd like to go out, I really would, Jane replied, setting the plate of bacon and eggs in front of me at the table. Okay, look, we'll go to the seven o'clock show. There are a few things I need to do at the office this afternoon, and I will be home by four. Maybe we can do last night all over again. You know, a repeat performance? Jane smiled a crooked smile, and her eyes had a faraway look. She reached down and rubbed my chest, making me try to remember just what we did do last night. I got up, and Jane grabbed me and forcefully kissed me, almost too hard. She forced my lower lip against my teeth, causing my lip to bleed. Wow, you kissed me pretty hard there, I said, as I held my finger to my lip and looking at the drop of bright red blood on my finger. Jane grabbed my hand, holding up to her ruby lips, and stuck my finger in her mouth and pulled it back out, licking the blood off my finger. Her eyes were glazed and distant, 
like she was under a spell. She came back to Earth and took a napkin and dabbed the rest of the blood until it stopped. Don't be late, she said. I have a surprise for you tonight. It will be perfect. I didn't know whether to feel aroused or to be frightened. Both feelings had my adrenaline going. So much so, I almost forgot about Sarah. Where was Sarah? Hopefully at the office? The scene last night was almost too crazy, much like a dream and one I wish I could forget. But I was with Sarah. I remember her fragrance. It was unique. One she told me she bought just for me. I needed to get to the office. I kissed Jane gently on the neck she exposed to me and then told her I was going to work. I mentioned to her I would be home before four. Maybe Jane was snapping out of her year-long funk. Maybe she was ready to try at our marriage she knew was slipping away from us. Then there was Sarah. I turned to head up to our bathroom to shower. On the way, I passed the hall closet and turned to go up the stairs. I thought I smelled Sarah, her fragrance, the perfume she had bought just for me. The fragrance just couldn't be Sarah. We weren't here. We were in a motel. Maybe her fragrance was still on me. I needed the shower before Jane recognized the fragrance was not hers. Chapter 2 The Burning Question As I drove to work, I couldn't stop thinking of her fragrance and how it filled my nostrils as I went from the hall to the steps leading up to our bedroom. Was Sarah in my house last night? Certainly not. I would surely not have tried to bring her here. Surely it was just her fragrance on me. I had cheated with her last night at the motel after having drinks together. Yes, the fragrance surely came from our little tryst. I should tell Jane, but I am such a coward. I pulled into the parking lot and felt the butterflies moving around in my stomach. I was working in this office for ten years now, and there was no reason to be this nervous but it was all about Sarah, my secretary since I started here. I wondered what kind of looks she would give me, what I needed to tell her about maybe breaking it off between us and giving my marriage one more shot. Or would I just keep on with Sarah and say nothing until this all blew up in everyone's face? I pulled into my parking spot designated just for Mark Jenkins, CEO. I parked the car and got my briefcase and keys, locking the door behind me, and walked to the office. Heading into the front office, I didn't see Sarah, but I just thought maybe she would be back putting papers on my desk. I walked back to my office, sharing the usual greetings of the morning to those I saw. When I got there, I saw nothing of Sarah. I went back to the front counter and asked Judy Branca, the receptionist, if she heard from Sarah. She said Sarah called in sick. She sounded bad, Judy added so bad in fact her voice just didn't sound like her at all okay there's a pretty good bug going around right now i replied i turned and headed back to my office sarah was rarely sick and rarely ever called in well she usually would call in to me not judy she didn't sound sick last night something just didn't feel right but i promised jane i would be home early so i better get to work and get some things done there were just too many things I couldn't recall about last night. I had to find out from the beginning just what happened. I sat down and started to work. Jane Jenkins had plans for her husband tonight. Plans her husband, Mark Jenkins, would never forget. She felt Mark's detachment from her, and she didn't like it. Last night was just the beginning, and biting his lip when she kissed him this morning was an indication she would show him what she was capable of all along and make him regret he ignored her for so long. She knew she had this hunger inside her. Last night was just the beginning of feeding herself, and she would feed off the very same hunger. A hunger for more than sex. Something much more. Two years ago, they fell into a bad rut. She no longer seemed to be interesting to Mark, and he often went out at night, seeking other ways to have fun. It might have been drinks with the guys from the office or chasing other women, but Jane was no fool and saw their romance fading into the woodwork. She wanted to do something about their relationship. But last night, well, 
Last night was different. She no longer sat back, sulking in her own pity. Jane thought it was time to take some action. Her actions last night not only stimulated her into coming out of her funk, but her actions also titillated, hmm, her sexually. Jane liked how anger and rage made her feel. She was gaining something she had lost long ago to her CEO husband. It was power. Mark stole it from her long ago, never realizing she had her own potential within. He did it on purpose because he was selfish and wanted her to think he was necessary for her to exist. Tonight, she would wield power he had never seen before. I worked for an hour, mostly with the distraction of Sarah on my mind. I thought better of it, but I have to text her, just to know she was okay. Are you okay? I pushed send. A minute, then two minutes, then my phone pinged. Yes, I am fine, just a bad cold. Good, I was worried. I have something I have to talk with you about. I pushed send again. If it was about last night, you were so good. Our sex together has never been better. You were so good. Have to go out with Jane tonight. Can we meet tomorrow? My phone pinged again. Sure, but don't have too much fun. Save your best for me. I put the phone down on my desk and covered my eyes with both hands, pressing against my eyeballs to make the pain go away. The hangover was still pretty bad, but I had one more day to make a decision. It had to be one or the other. Jane or Sarah. I couldn't keep this up any longer. I had to choose. Jane or Sarah was the burning question. Chapter 3 Date Night I left her home around 3.30 in the afternoon. I had not talked to Sarah, and the temptation to call her was there, but I resisted as I wasn't too far from the house. The text and the fact she texted back to me had to do for now. I pulled into my driveway at the same time I had told Jane I would be home. When I got inside, the music was playing upstairs and I assumed Jane was up there getting ready. Honey, I'm home, I called out setting my briefcase on the parson's bench by the coat rack in the hall. Hey there, she replied, looking down to me from above as she looked more remarkable in just a towel than I can ever remember, her tan body wrapped in just a white towel. I thought you might want to have a little pee. As she stood there facing me and opening her white towel to reveal to me her naked self, and then quickly covering back up. I know I can be such a tease. But I just had to give you some indication of what our date night will be like tonight. Jane licked her lips and smiled. All I can say to how you look is, well, wow. I exclaimed as I scurried up the steps to meet her. I kissed her and she threw her arms around my neck. Her wet towel rubbing against my white shirt belied the heat coming from her tan and naked skin. Jane had never been this hot for the past year. I barely recall anything this steamy in our ten years of marriage. I felt so hot. I barely felt my cut lip from this morning. I was starting to sweat. Jane pulled away gently and looked into my eyes with a look I am sure I never encountered from her before. It was mesmerizing. You don't want us to miss dinner now, do you? She asked. Of course not. I'll jump in the shower in just a second. But first I need one more look at you. Your face, it's so stunning and beautiful. Your smile is one I haven't seen in such a long time. We walked back into the bedroom together and I held her close to kiss her once more. This question, this burning question in my mind, I know what we have been through these past years. Is it really going to change? Is Jane really coming around? Is this what I really want? And is going to change on Monday? I shook off the thoughts. I hurried into the shower, toweling off quickly and dressing in a casual style. A white open collar shirt, a pair of black slacks, and a black sport coat. Jane was already dressed and looking gorgeous in a short black dress with the hemline well above the knee and a necklace I gave her many Christmases ago. She never looked this stunning to me since our wedding day. We left the house, locked the door, and drove to our favorite restaurant, Montalto's. Jane held my hand most of the way and, at times, 
She seemed to almost squeeze it too hard. I took it to mean she was wanting our relationship to work. Maybe she felt this chance was one she didn't want to screw up. I don't know, but I was liking this G. We were seated at a table facing the lighted busy street. The white lights shining on Jane's face through the front window of the restaurant gave her an appearance of pure elegance. Her face seemed to be the one I married ten years ago. She looked so alive and vibrant. We had appetizers, an entree, and had just finished dessert over very stimulating conversation when the light changed from bright white to an angry red. Must have been a police car or ambulance, but suddenly I saw something different in her eyes as I paid the check with a card and waited for the server to return. Jane, are you okay? I asked, laying my hand over the top of hers. She instinctively pulled her hand away from mine, something she had done a lot of lately. Look, if you don't feel well, we can leave if you like. I'm fine, really. What makes you think I'm not okay? I'm just making plans in my head for you, dear. Plans we have never participated in during our whole marriage. Sexy, powerful plans. It was a look on your face. You didn't look happy. Oh, but I am, dear. I'm happy just being here with you, she said, smiling and showing teeth, somehow oddly reflecting the red flashing light on her white teeth, making them appear, well, bloody. This was a far cry from when she had nothing on but a towel upstairs in our home earlier. She leaned towards me, her bright red teeth glistening with what appeared to be blood. I cringed but caught myself. I'm sure it's just the guilt I'm feeling about Sarah, I thought. Jane certainly was not capable of anything mean or vicious. I kept thinking how this whole affair I was having with Sarah wasn't fair to Jane. I either had to tell her about Sarah or just concentrate on being a better husband to Jane. Red teeth. Bloody teeth. Uh-oh. Am I really here or is this just another illusion? What's happening? I quickly erased the thoughts and leaned in closer to Jane, smelling her fragrance. I immediately got a lump in my throat. Let's go home, I whispered to her softly. I'm feeling something very powerful for you and I don't want to lose the moment. Yes, let's do. I'm feeling very warm and the movie can wait for another day. I'm getting down right hot for you, my handsome CEO. I have something planned for you. You're going to love it, Jane said with the voice of an angel. My thoughts were laser-focused on Sarah's perfume I smelled on Jane. The fragrance brought a lump in my throat. Surely it was just my olfactory sense playing with my mind. Or was it? Then I thought once again. Red teeth. Red teeth. Jane rubbed my arm all the way home, moving up to my shoulder, then my neck, and then rubbing my thigh, close to my crotch. She leaned over and kissed my ear. I was getting to the point where we needed to be home. I was feeling Jane's hunger and sensing some urgency in her. Maybe Jane was wanting me too. Possibly we could go back to the early years in our marriage where we didn't make love but consumed each other. Was this really happening? We walked from the garage into our lovely home and headed up the steps to our bedroom. Jane immediately stepped out of her black dress and went to the bathroom to fill our jacuzzi tub and place some candles around it. She came back out of the bathroom as water continued to run in the jacuzzi. Jane next turned on some music on our home speaker system. Jazz, very sultry and mood enhancing. Jane had maintained her body over the years and she looked so fit and tan. It must have been something I had ignored for a while during my affair with Sarah. How did we get this far off and not come back full circle? Does she know about Sarah and she is now trying to win me back? Surely she doesn't know. She looks so good. I quickly undressed too, and Jane, still in her underwear and bra, went downstairs to get us a drink. While she was gone, I caught a lingering smell of the perfume again, the one Sarah wore the last time we were together. I know this can't be, but the fragrance smelled very real, and it was on Jane. My nostrils were not playing tricks on me. It was totally entrenched in my mind. How could Jane be wearing Sarah's perfume? Suddenly, Jane reappeared with two drinks in hand. She was totally naked now and headed right past me to the bathroom. 
She set the two drinks on the edge of the tub and turned off the water. She turned to look at me and smiled. Well, aren't you going to join me? I quickly took off my boxers and headed to the tub and slipped into the hot water with bubbles on top from the jacuzzi jets. Jane got in and sat opposite me. Her red lips were inviting as I took a few sips of my scotch and Jane a long swig of her wine. She raised her eyebrows as she looked deeply into my eyes. So, how do you like date night so far, my handsome husband? I'm loving it, I replied, setting my drink down on the tub's edge. I leaned in close to her, wanting to kiss her. The warm water stimulating my whole body and the jacuzzi jets massaging us both. She leaned in close, kissing me gently at first and then even more passionately. The kiss seemed at least a minute long. The perfume you are wearing, is it new? I asked, taking another long drink of the scotch. Yes, I bought it just for you this morning while you were at work. Do you like it? Jane whispered, exposing her neck to me and I leaned in to kiss her. I love it, it's intoxicating, I said, rubbing the inner parts of her thighs. Sarah's perfume. I took my hands from under the water and brushed her bangs from her eyes. I knew the burning question would haunt me, but I had to decide. I couldn't keep this charade going on forever. It was now or never. I had to make this decision soon. Jane looked perfect tonight, and it seems I need to know this new Jane, one I don't remember, or in fact never was. Something had changed, and so far, it all seemed to be for the better. Let's go to the bed, she cooed, and in an instant we both hurried out of the tub to dry off. I felt a sudden dizziness when I got up, but just passed it off as the scotch taking effect and being in the hot water. I walked to the bed and sat down on the edge. Jane slid over from her side of the bed and sitting up massaging my neck and shoulders. I was feeling more than a drink's effect. I began to see the room spinning, and then the lights seemed to go on and off. What is going on? I turned to Jane, wanting to see something in her eyes that could help me. Jane, I think something is wrong. Maybe you should call 911, I said hurriedly as the spinning was becoming more pronounced. The whirling of the room's furniture looking like a tilt-a-whirl came rushing at me from all sides. I closed my eyes yet heard Jane's voice. Sure, baby, sure, she said as she grabbed her phone. Hello, 911? I think my husband is having a heart attack. Jane quickly blurted out the address and set the phone down. My world was getting black, and I thought in this very moment, I was dying. Chapter 4 The Burning Question Answered I know I was hearing it in a dream. The voices were clear. A man's voice. Now that should about do it. My mind was foggy, and I tried to lift my head off the pillow to look around and focus on what was blurry. I was struggling to open my eyes, and I couldn't get the blurry images to become clear. Something was on my hands and legs. Was I in the hospital? I tried to move, but I couldn't. There was something pulling on my legs and arms. I tried to fight harder, but my body was too sluggish to do anything. I looked over to my left, and the smell wafting through my nostrils. Perfume? No, this just couldn't be. It was the smell of the same perfume. Sarah's perfume? Jane's? Where in the hell was I? There was Jane, sitting up in bed, her naked breasts exposed. This was deja vu. You were so good last night, Jane said, noticing my look of disbelief and horror. Why, you look like you've just seen a ghost, she chuckled. You don't remember, do you? You do remember date night and taking me to dinner, don't you? And... How you took a nice jacuzzi with me when we got home? You wanted to go to bed with me, but you thought you were ill. You wanted me to call 911. Remember? But you did. I heard your voice telling them our address. I heard you. Yes, dear, you did. But I pretended to dial. I never called 911. It was only the effect of the sleeping pills in your drink making you pass out. And now, here you are, my love. If you still wanted the sex, I guess it's too bad as you're a little tied up right now. Jane threw her head back and laughed loudly at her joke. 
Jane, what's happening? What's going on? Oh, just here to see if you can answer the burning question, my love. What burning question? Oh, don't play dumb, Mark. I knew you and Sarah had a thing going. Jeff here told me all about it. Seems he followed you and Sarah to your little trysts at those seedy motels. I didn't believe him at first. Then he actually took me there and removed all my doubt. Jeff Painter? Sarah's husband, Jeff? I asked. I started to get my feeling back in my body and looked down to see all I had on was a towel laying across my groin area and my hands and feet were tied to the bedposts. I was still too sluggish to struggle. I felt helpless and began to feel sweat running down my forehead into my eyes, making them burn. Don't look so surprised, Mark. I followed you and Sarah to those places. Jane never believed me, but I took her with me once to follow you and Sarah. She didn't believe me until I showed her what a prick you were. Jeff said clearly and with an edge of hate in his voice. So we teamed up that night, drugged you, and I went home to see Sarah and confront her. So, where's Sarah? I asked, looking at Jane and then back at Jeff. What did you do with her? Oh, she's here. She's just fine. In fact, she's right here in the room with you, Jane said, getting up from the bed and putting on her robe. It's your burning question, isn't it, Mark? It was going to be the discussion at some point, right? You telling me how wonderful she was to you and you were going to leave me for her? Jane said, her voice gaining in volume with each word. I looked around for Sarah. There was no Sarah to be found. Mark, you are so unaware. Just like you were with me, never focusing on me, looking all around me until you found someone better. Someone who could meet your needs. Well, it's just too bad you can't have her. See, the answer to your burning question of whether it's me or Sarah is you get neither. Looking all around, all around for your poor Sarah. But there she is right next to you. Look, Mark, she yelled, pointing to her left. I finally turned my head to the side far enough to see the body wrapped in cellophane and tied to a chair the legs sticking straight out from rigor mortis. The face, so blue and so lifeless, was Sarah's face. Cuts on her face and dried blood showing through the cellophane. The needles pricking my skin at the sight of dead Sarah wrapped in cellophane made my heart skip a beat. What did you both do? I questioned, trying to free myself from the ropes, tying me to the bed. It was easy once you got home. Jane said. I drugged your water you keep on the nightstand. You drank it, then you fell asleep. The sleeping pills made your hangover the next day so oppressive. It is the plan I told you about at dinner last night. Quite a plan, don't you think, Mark? Therefore, you woke up with Jane, not Sarah. It was the reason why you were confused when you woke up, Jeff said, grinning with evil in his eyes. Thought you were supposed to wake up in bed with my wife. Instead, you woke up in your own bed with your own wife. You were so disoriented you had no idea where you were. It was a nice plan. I did kill Sarah at home and then brought her here. I confronted her about you, Mark, and she tried to lie. It was one thing to catch you both, but I just couldn't take the lies anymore. I was putting your affair with my wife to an end. But I texted her. She texted back. She was still alive. I exclaimed, beginning to sweat profusely at the thought I would be the next to die. I texted you back, my love, Jane said. I had Sarah's phone. Jeff brought it to me when you left for work. It was just to keep you in the game long enough. I am much too weak to hold you or tie you up. Here's where my new partner, Jeff, worked into the plan. He did a great job of securing you to the bed, tying Sarah's dead and stiff body to the chair, and finally, well, I was going to let him kill you for me. But you see, at this point, I feel the strength you wouldn't give me. The fact you always thought I was weak and you could have me do anything as long as it suited you. Only what you wanted. Well, I have the power over you now. There's nothing you can do. 
If only you could have seen it years ago. If only you would have loved me completely and never strayed. If only you would have given me the power and let me love you, I wouldn't have had to do this. Jane walked over to Jeff, who handed her the gleaming long-bladed knife. She gripped the handle as Jeff had told her to. It was the same way he gripped the knife when he had killed Sarah Friday night. Now, she was about to do something she thought she would never be able to do. Until I cheated on her. She stood over me, staring down with her smile. Red teeth. I was fearful, and Jane could see it in my eyes. It was exactly what she wanted. I smelled her fragrance. Sarah's fragrance. I looked over at Sarah's cellophane-wrapped body, the blue face, and looked back to Jane. Please, no. Don't do this. Oh, now you want to make up to me? You know I love you. You just, just didn't respond to me. I stuttered. Jane mimicked me. You just, just quit wanting to sleep with me. You wanted all the power. You wanted to control me. Now hold still and it will be less painful. My body tried to move side to side away from the point of the knife slowly descending to my chest. She started to carve and I gritted my teeth. I wanted to jump but was afraid she would plunge the knife into me. She carved out a J and the drops of blood began to ooze out of the shallow cuts. There you go. J, that's for me. She carved out an S next, and more blood came oozing out. Of course, S is for Sarah. Now a question mark. Talking through clenched teeth, I asked her, why? Why the question mark? Jane smiled and answered, It's the burning question, right? Jane or Sarah? Sarah or Jane? Here, let me answer it for you, dear Mark. The answer is neither. You get neither, you asshole. Her voice had elevated to nearly a scream. Jeff has me now, and you could have had me. Once I knew you were cheating on me, I never wanted you back. I just wanted to kill you. I wanted the power. I needed the power. You were too self-absorbed to give it to me. So I'm taking it now. No going back. No starting over. You get nothing, Mark, except what you have coming to you. Finish him. Do it now. Jeff bellowed as he moved closer to see this with his own eyes. Look, you forgot the point of the question, Mark. How ironic. The question, Mark. <laughs> Jeff laughed hideously, and I saw nothing but pure and unadulterated evil in his eyes. He stepped forward, putting his evil face right in front of my own. I see, Jeff. I left it undone, Jane said as she drove the blade deep into Mark's stomach, finishing off the point of the question mark in dramatic fashion. She twisted the blade and removed it slowly from Mark's abdomen. Blood was flowing freely now, and I couldn't breathe. I was losing blood quickly, and there wasn't anyone who could possibly hear me if I screamed as the music had been turned up very loud. Goodbye, Mark, Jane said as she handed the knife over to Jeff, who ended Mark's life, cutting his throat from ear to ear blackness. Mark was no more. Chapter 5 The Drive Four hours later, the bodies were loaded in the trunk, wrapped in cellophane and sheets. Two coal bodies of the cheaters needed to be together. Jeff drove and Jane looked out of the window. The old road leading to the wooded area which held an old abandoned farmhouse was made of gravel and was slightly muddy due to the earlier rain. The dumping would be easy. They arrived at the spot where the well was a few yards from the old house. Jeff knew where the well was as he had scouted this out long before. The well was deep and the bodies were easily hoisted by Jane and Jeff. The bodies seemed to float in slow motion until they reached darkness then the two bodies hit the bottom of the well with a loud thud, making Jane jump a little. With very little fanfare, they both got to the car and cleaned everything with bleach as to leave no trace of DNA. They headed for the car wash and then the motel, the same one they caught Sarah and Mark. They showered and changed clothes, and within one hour were headed back to the car to go to the airport. Sure, they would be seen on the motel security cam, but... They'd be long gone before anyone would notice they were gone. 
they destroyed their cell phones and had burners ready to replace their old phones. There would be no way they could be tracked. The authorities may find their destination, but Jeff and Jane would have changed identities before the authorities could ever track them to Brazil. They arrived in an hour, and Jeff asked Jane if she remembered her passport. She nodded her head yes, and they were on the plane within the hour. Soon, they would be landing in Brazil. It was a temporary stay, as they would have to be on the move. Soon, someone would be tracking them when Mark and Sarah didn't show up for work. They would manage to move around and avoid detection as Jeff had inherited enough money from his father to keep them moving and purchasing new identities. Jane, on the other hand, had emptied out all of Mark's accounts he had accumulated through hard work and becoming the CEO of his own company. They were going to be fine. At least Jeff thought so. The deed was done, and she and Jeff had avoided any detection for a month now. The news at home was Sarah, Jeff, Mark, and Jane had all come up missing. The news was reporting some type of spousal cheating may be involved. There were no signs of foul play. Up to this point, no bodies were found. Jeff and Jane's relationship never grew, and the sex was okay, but losing their respective spouses seemed to have some effect on their intimacy. Jane knew Jeff had given her the power she never possessed, and somehow their intimacy was due to something they had in common, dead spouses. Jeff felt like straying at times, but he knew what Jane was capable of doing. Maybe being unfaithful wasn't the thing to do right now. He was on his way back to the small bungalow they had purchased to stay hidden. Its location was high enough to see out into the street. Jane was at the window, looking out over the city of Rio de Janeiro. She noticed Jeff walking up the sidewalk when he was encountered by a young Brazilian prostitute. They talked for just a minute, and Jeff headed away from their bungalow and disappeared from Jane's sight. Later in the evening, when Jeff came in, he drank his bottle of water and slipped into bed with Jane. Jane never reacted, and Jeff thought he had possibly gotten away with it. In the morning, Jeff's head was pounding, and he opened his eyes and watched the ceiling fan turn around, almost making him more ill than he thought. He looked over and said, Andrea? Andrea, I have to go now. He looked at the figure that sat up in bed exposing her naked breasts. Jeff was waking up with Jane. Jesus, Jane. What the? Oh my word, Jeff. You look like you've seen a ghost or something. Jane said, holding the knife the way Jeff had taught her. Who is Andrea, Jeff? I saw you with the little whore. What is it with you men? Jane stood, and the knife she held in her hand appeared from under the sheet. Jeff saw the point of the knife, the sharp, gleaming blade slowly descending to his chest in slow motion. There was nothing he could do. He was tied up to the bedposts. Jane had the power, the power Jeff had given to her. How ironic. Blood, darkness, money. Jeff was no more. Goodbye, Jeff. I hope you enjoyed tonight's production of Waking Up With Jane, written by Malcolm Tanner. Malcolm Tanner is an accomplished writer, was a contributor in the book Education Belly Slappers by Jim Rowe. Malcolm followed the Mike Parsons trilogy, Redemption, which was recently released on Audible, performed by yours truly, Redemption 2, Allison's Revenge, Redemption 3, Death at Downers Grove, with a new literary titan gold medal winning book that he released March 14, 2021 entitled Drowning My Suspicions. You can go to his website at www.malcolmtanner.com That's M-A-L-C-O-L-M-T-A-N-N-E-R dot com There you can find his books in the news stories, human interest stories, and a place to sign up for his email list. Malcolm Tanner can also be followed on Facebook at MT Followers, also at Malcolm Tanner LLC, or on Instagram at Malcolm Tanner 
8927. If you enjoyed tonight's story hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.